everyone, welcome to Memo. I am very excited today for my guest, Ryan Roxy. Ryan Roxy has done a million things, but he is probably best known for being a guitarist for the Alice Cooper Band. How are you, Ryan Roxy? Hello, thanks for having me on. Of course, it's a pleasure to have you on. Funny thing, when I was writing you, I was like, dear Ryan Roxy, and I'm like, that's not really his name. And then I was like, dear Roxy, and that didn't feel right. And then I was like, dear Ryan, and that didn't really feel right either. What do most people <laughs> call you in your life? I feel, you know, it, Roxy's completely legit to say, because I've been calling myself Ryan Roxy uh, since a very, very young age, probably like sixth grade. I think that's when I officially kind of changed it. And I was very, very lucky in the sense that the first time I went to the DMV to get a driver's license, there must have been someone that was on their first week or something like that. Cause when they asked me my name, I said, well, it's, it's Rosowitz, you know, Roksovich, if you really want to get all Polish on us. And, but uh, I, I go by the name Ryan Roxy. So he just typed it in and I was literally Ryan Roxy from my uh, first driver's license. And then came the. Like uh, 15 and a half or something like that. Yeah. That's when you got, that's right. Yeah. In California, I got a, a learner's permit at 15 and a half, the actual driver's license at 16. But uh, yeah. So, so, you know, throughout the years, uh, if you call me Roxy, I'm, I'm very cool with that. Um, if you really want to be, you know, if you're angry at me, call me like my mom would call me Ryan Peter. So, you know, I'm not really into the middle name Ryan Peter. <laughs> so it means I'm getting yelled at at one point. Um, but yeah, I, I like, I just like Roxy. It's fine. All right. That's good. Now, so that, that question has been solved. Um, so about your driver's license, I've heard you tell that story before and we always wonder, did that ever get you in trouble legally? Like, cause you must've, had to get a social security card at some point around that time when you started working yeah. and then like passports and stuff. So did it ever cause you like any sort of legal trouble having- It was a smooth transition. No, because I, I never really worked as Roksovich. I, I've always been Ryan Roxy. And, you know, once you have that, about that one piece of ID, that is, I mean, I had always read and it's urban legend that you have to go fill out these papers and you have to go to a, a swearing in and there's all these kind of stuff. Trust me, I read all the all the kiss interviews about how Paul Stanley changed his name. And of course, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, <laughs> you know, it always seemed like it was much harder. Like I said, I, I got very lucky in the sense that one of my official documents was uh legally changed uh, at a very young age. So then therefore came the, um, that therefore came the, the uh, what did you call it? The social security number with the job. And then the big hurdle was the passport because it was Ryan Roxy, AKA Ryan Roksevich because there was the birth uh, certificate involved and all that kind of stuff. But then uh, that, changed over the years too because i guess after you've been calling yourself paying taxes all that kind of stuff for a number of years you can just be ryan roxy just That's like the way alice cooper is alice cooper okay. because everyone always you know texts me or they message me and they say well what about vincent and i'm like you know <laughs> what alice's wife calls him alice alice's mother calls him alice so guess what he's alice, alice. <laughs> well, that's great because I just I, I heard that I'm like, that's so cool as a young kid, but I just imagine all these nightmare things happening after the fact, like the first time you go on tour, you know, and people are like looking at you going, you know, who are you or whatever, but I'm glad at it that point I was very lucky. Like I said, I had the actual, you know, document to go with this and, uh, <laughs> you know. I never had to use that. Uh, this is my backstage pass. I never had to use that line, although I've been dying to use it. At one you point. should use it in twenty twenty one when you resume touring. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> let's 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 hope for that. Everyone's going to be wearing masks from now on anyway. It might be the new norm that everybody oh, just okay. wears masks all the time. So you are going to have to like show some sort of ID, but then you're going to have a mask on, and then you're just going to have to go. Well, trust me, this is my. It is me. It's this backstage it's pass. <laughs> All right. So since we're talking about the early days, which of course is my favorite topic of all, um, how old were you when you first got into music? And I'm not even talking about when you decided you wanted to do this for a living, but the first time you heard music and you thought, this is amazing. And I want to be like, I want this to be my world. Yeah, it's a very young age. Well, um, getting into rock music, especially was, I think, 
pretty early and I was fortunate enough to be born right at that cool time of music where everything was kind of converging, whether you call it classic rock or whether you call it, uh, you know, old school rock. And then there was all these new bands coming out as well, and which eventually became punk rock, which eventually became new wave. And it was basically the early 70s. So I was, you know, born in 65. I kind of had my first uh, real taste of rock and roll in in the seventies, early seventies. And, um, I was hooked ever since. And, it, and part of it, it wasn't even really, um, I would say hard rock. A lot of it was pop rock. And, and I credit, uh, I grew up in the Bay area in the San Francisco area. I, I credit KFRC, which is our, uh, sort of Bay area AM radio station. And I credit Dr. Don Rose, uh, who was the morning DJ for playing all these amazing rock bands and eventually disco bands that would meld together, that would co- sort of form uh, everything that I was influenced by uh, musically from there on out, you know? So I would be listening to KFRC in the morning with Dr. Don Rose and he would play like a Commodore song, if you will, you know, or, or maybe even something like our earth, wind and fire but then right after Earth, Wind & Fire, he'd play, you know, a new band like Aerosmith or, you know, <laughs> at that point, you know, or a new band like Cheap Trick. And then he would, you know, and I, I just love the fact that AM radio back in those days wasn't just talk radio. Like, I, I guess AM radio today is basically the equivalent of what we're doing. A lot of talk radio, a lot of sports radio and stuff. Um, and I love that too. But at the same time, I wouldn't be where um, I'm at today musically if it wasn't for uh, AM radio and sort of that blend of dance music and funk music and uh, especially rock and roll. And that was all up, that was that was the Bay Area music scene. Now you picked up a few different instruments as a kid. I read you spent a short time with the trumpet, which I believe your dad played at one point. My first <laughs> instrument was the trumpet, yes. Uh, school band. I figured out very, very quickly that that was not going to impress the ladies at all. That was, <laughs> trumpet was basically, and, it, and you, had, you had to move your mouth really, you know, you had to make your mouth all tight and stuff like that. And you know what? There's very few trumpet rock stars. There's definitely trumpet rock stars out there, jazz guys, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a long road if you, you know, it's a long way to the top you want to make it, if you want to rock and roll, it's even longer if you want to play, do it playing trumpet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I went from that to, to uh, the guitar was the, was laying on the couch. So it was, it was always there. It was an acoustic guitar that was laying on the couch and I would just strum it. I didn't really know how to play it, but uh, it seemed pretty easy. But then, you know, I wanted to hit things. I wanted to bang things. And, and that was the drums. And, uh, you know, my father played trumpet. My mother played drums in the marching band. So uh, drums was sort of the next sort of thing. And, and you, could, you could play drums in school, in the school band. You couldn't really play guitar in any sort of school band until I got it, you know, until later years when I was in the j- school jazz band. But then you know, that wasn't really playing guitar. It was more playing comp chords and very clean. It wasn't the way I wanted it to sound, you know, but it was playing guitar, but uh, first trumpet, then drums, then finally settled like, hey, this is where I feel comfortable at. When you found the guitar, did you get serious with it? Uh, Not found it, but when you really kind of took it up after the drums, did you get serious with it right away? Like, were you that kid that practiced six, six, eight, 10 hours a day, or did did it take you Mm. a while to find your way to that place? I I think I practiced a lot in the mirror. I think I did a lot of air guitar because, you know, (laughs) and, and when people in later years would call me a poser, I would say, for sure, I I am a poser. I'm a professional, you know, poser for years and years because air guitar was kind of what I would do mimicking the albums that I love to listen to whether it was the Beatles or you know those early cheap trick records I would be in front of the mirror you know sort of strumming not even plugged in sometimes so I spent I I would say I spent a lot of time practicing uh, the moves Um, the actual fundamentals 
I was pretty, uh, pretty okay at getting certain exercises and certain motor skills down. And that's what I sort of preach to this day is that, you know, if you do want to pursue music as a, as more than just a hobby and more than just something that uh, helps you therapeutically, if you want to actually take it seriously, you have to be good. You have to know your, your motor skills. And that's, that's sort of half of the equation of playing any instrument. You have to be good at it and you have to get good at it in practice. But, um, you know, like I, like I said, I picked it up at such a young age. It was on the couch. It was strumming it at five. I think I started taking lessons at around seven years old, mm-hmm. nine years old, you know, some local, uh, talent shows that I was able to join and, uh, you know, surprisingly win uh, a couple of these, these sort of things, which is probably pretty good for a little kid with his ego and wants to like, hey, I can do this. This is easy. But, you know, then, then the real work starts, then you start listening to guys like, you know, 1977 comes around and you know, Queen News of the World album comes out or, you know, something like that, or so many albums from 77. And uh, you start listening to these musicians that you go, okay, now I really have to work on this if that's what I'm going to do. So I think around the age 11 is when I decided like, hey, you got to take this seriously. And even then, it wasn't like, you know, I, I, I read interviews about a lot of guys that practice till their fingers bleed and that's amazing for them that's great I was um never that guy I mean I definitely did practice but when I was uninspired I I walked away from it and luckily at that age there was a couple other things not today where there's like a bazillion other things to do whether it's online or whether you know it, there, there was a couple things I could play baseball I could throw the football around um you know I could actually d- work on school band music and stuff like that, you know, with the drums, because I was still playing uh, uh, in the marching band as playing drums in that. But like I said, it's like around 11, 12, it's, I started to like really take it a little bit more serious and think this is the path I want to pursue. And then it wasn't until like, I would say, huh, 17 or 18, when I went to Los Angeles, when I moved to Los Angeles and uh, went to very early years of uh, GIT, which is, you know, Guitar Institute. And it was not even really an institute at all. It was just a place where a bunch of guitar players were hanging out. But that school taught me so much about good practice habits. You know, I'm not sure if I became, I didn't become a shredder. I don't think from that school, but it definitely instilled some good practice habits for me. And we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a lot about this actually in a little bit, um, which is your system 12. Um, But how much of this did you think about when you were, when you were putting that together? Like maybe those moments where you didn't feel like practicing as much, you wanted to get to that place where you could maybe shred or, you know, play a song really well without, you know, you know. Well, luckily there was other things in your life. There was certain shortcuts that I was able to learn over the years that culminated in what, you know, I'm doing with System 12. And for those of you that don't know what System 12 is, it's a, uh, it's a guitar teaching method that I've come up with, in, not just in the last year, it's me and the whole team that I'm working with, you know, uh, Robbie Miller and Dave Rattenberry and Vic Chalfant and Scotty Hagan, you know, our whole team. And Federica as well. This whole team has come up with something that it's easier to learn guitar, but I, I've taken so many of these tricks and so many of these shortcuts that I learned on the way, I guess you could say on the way up or just on, on the journey so that people that want to pick up guitar can have that much of a uh, advantage using my method. And I think you can learn guitar much quicker. But uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, luckily I was taught some uh, really cool uh, sort of tricks and ways of looking at the guitar um, early on. And I've, you know, a lot of those habits and uh, sort of things that I learned and sort of discovered, I'm able to pass on to the next people that want to learn. That's amazing. We're going to talk a lot more about that in a little bit. Um, I want to um, talk to you about some of the 
amazing bands that you've played in. One of the first that always comes up is a band called Candy. And how old were you when that band came together? Hmm. That was, Candy was pretty much, like I, I say, I played about 100 bands in 98, you, you know, you never heard of. Maybe the 97th or 96, you might have, a couple people might have heard of Candy before. That was basically the first uh, big Los Angeles-based band that I had played in. Uh, other than my own local bands that I had played in the Bay Area with. And uh, Candy had a reputation for being sort of a a pop band trapped in the body of, you know, a, a hair metal uh, sort of image. And, and we definitely had hair and, you know, should have been sponsored by Aquanet <laughs> and should have had you know, full-on endorsements. But, yeah, we probably... Uh, contributed to the global warming with, you know, our consumption of Aquanet aerosol <laughs> hairspray throughout the years, there's no doubt. Um, and passing out gazillion of flyers that, uh, you know, 0.001% of people actually would come after you <laughs> hand out a thousand paper flyers on Sunset Boulevard and you get 10 people that would come to the show. So, uh, you played the numbers game, I guess. But uh, Candy was that band. Luckily, um, I guess that would have been around 80, what, 84. I moved down in 83, 84, 85. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like right around 19, 20 years old, um, I was I was joined Candy. And uh, it was a cool band to be in. I mean, there's no doubt because they had already had sort of a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people around the Los Angeles scene knew a bunch of the players. So that whole association uh, thing, which I feel is important to be uh, around, you know, just hanging, being able to hang in the same room with a lot of credible musicians actually helps your own sort of credibility. And uh, that, sort of led to one band led to another and all bands, you know, eventually lead either back to the same guys in Mike's story, you know, cause years later I go up and play with Gilby again with in his solo dad. band and Gilby was the guitarist and uh, singer in Candy as well when I was playing with him. And um, so, you know, it, it was a good band to sort of have that foundation with. You know, and it's part my whole, it was a it was candy, which, which very quickly morphed into uh, two different bands. They we kind of fractured off and then candy morphed in the majority of candy morphed into the electric angels and Gilby went on his own to form a band called kill for thrills. Mm -hmm. And then from kill for thrills, Gilby got into guns and roses and the rest is history. Right. But electric angels, there was a lot of firsts for me for that. It was the first time I ever played across the U.S. It was the first time I ever done any real type of, you know, touring, whether it wasn't, you know, touring in tour buses, but it was touring in a van and, you know, a U-Haul and, you know, rent a cars and somebody else's cars. And, uh, but it, it, got, it gave me so much experience. It was my first, you know, professional major label band, which, you know, thank God for candy, because that led me into Electric Angels. So Electric Angels made an album and then I believe, I can't remember if you guys actually were able to make the second album or if you got dropped before that came out, but what was yeah, that? Yeah, we, we <laughs> be careful what you wish for because <clears throat> always because we were, we were saying, we, we don't want to be on this label anymore. We don't want to be on Atlanta. We don't want to be in, and I always remember uh, one of our lawyers saying, look, guys, slow down. It's always better to be on a label than not be on. But but wait a second, if we get off the label, then we'll just, you know, we have all these songs, they're ready to go. You know, someone else will pick it up right away. These songs are even, you know, way better than the first album, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden we found ourselves not on a label and no label picking it up either. So it was one of those situations that was unfortunate because I, I actually did think that the songs on the second record, uh, that we had made for the second record were actually coming along. We were progressing as a band. Everything was, was moving along the way bands do. I mean, you definitely, we were growing and we had spent a lot of time 
uh, touring together after the first album. We had done tours across the U.S. with Danger Danger at that point and another band called Hurricane. And, um, you know, we were like we were we were fighting a lot like bands do, I think, after being together as many years as we had been together. But it wasn't like completely it wasn't those those ugly, ugly fights. Well, maybe me and Shane, the singer, had a couple ugly ones. But for the most part, it was it was just like, you know, trying to push the best out of each other out. And uh, what ended up happening is that we demoed up all these songs that uh, that basically became what is this, the second Electric Angels album, which is has been released a couple years ago. For a while, it was floating around on the dark web or wherever you could you could find certain yeah. aura forums and certain you know sort of fan groups that were like, oh yeah, I've, I I have these Lost Angel tapes, you know, it's it's, it's the Lost Electric Angel tapes, and um, well, you know, we eventually turned it into an actual album. And um, yeah, I mean, you can judge for yourself, but I mean, it's hard to compare, uh, you know, releasing demos as a second album when our first album we were able to produce with, um, you know, a very, very cool producer named Tony Visconti. He was, who worked with, you know, all of Mark Bowen's albums with all the T-Rex albums. He had uh, produced David Bowie before he had wow. arranged and, and and sort of arranged strings and worked with, you know, Paul McCartney. So for, for him, you know, for us, he was like, sort of like, he's our guy, you know, and we're so lucky to get him to produce our first album. We've got, to, it was the first time I went to Europe. Uh, first time I ever spent any time in Europe was recording that album there. So there's a lot of firsts with Electric Angels. And um, as I, I love the first album and I'm happy the, with the way it turned out. Um, but I also think that the second album is, is worth a, uh, at least the songs on the second album are worth a listen to. You know, I recently spoke to Lorraine Lewis, uh, who's now, of course, in Vixen and who was in Femme Fatale for the longest time. And they had a similar situation where they kind of got dropped before the second album was made. They had some demos and they did eventually put it out just like you guys did. Um, and she did say that it, was a, it wasn't exactly what it would have been had they made the album, especially at that time. But I think there was a sense of like, it's done, it's out there. And as a fan, I'm thrilled, right? Because I, I get to hear it. I get to hear the thing that I waited forever for. So when all is said and done, are you glad it's out there or? Absolutely, is, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm actually really happy that it's out there because it's, it's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. It, the cool thing about, you know, knock on wood, maybe, maybe it's just my ego or maybe it's just that I've been very lucky is that there's nothing I'm embarrassed to, you know, to say, oh yeah, I was a part of that. Even, you know, with my solo stuff on my first Dad's Porno Mag album that with the band I put together around those songs, you know, there's a song called Smell My Finger. And you know what? I still am not, you know, well, for one, it was the band called Dad's Porno Mag, so that kind of lays it <laughs> lays it right out there, you know, for everyone to you know see right there with the name of the band. But you know, there was a song, and it was a good song, and and it is a good song. So it's funny that I still get requests to play that song live today, and it's just, of course, you know, it's a little, it's it it, it does feel a little bit different singing the song. <laughs> You're a when father you, of two now, aren't you? Yeah, father of so. two and 55. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not really smelling my fingers these days. I'm, I'm <laughs> fine with that. And, uh, <laughs> but it is a love song, I tell people. And, uh, but, but like I said, luckily, all the, the releases that I've been a part of, I've been able to be a part of over the years, I'm really proud of the, of the music that came out, whether it was Electric Angels and the first album and then subsequent second album, or it was the the tracks that I was able to contribute with Gilby Clark's stuff, as well as, um, of course, the the whole Slash's Snake Pit album, Ain't Life Grand, still to this day is one of my, you know, favorite sort of nice, it's one of those uh, diamonds in the rough. Not a lot of people know about Ain't Life Grand, but the people that do are hardcore fans. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, I, I have a pretty big catalog 
of uh, my own stuff. And uh, I have a box set that I put out a few years ago called the Roxy Box. And I compiled like pretty much all the albums and solo stuff and, and sort of collaborations that I did over the years. And it ended up being 70 songs. So, you know, it's a pretty cool box set. I'm proud of that. And then there was a band in Sweden that I played in called Casablanca was able to contribute to two albums with that, with that band. And those again are, are a good collection of songs. And I, you know, at the end of the day, if, if I can write songs and, and contribute to songs, um, that make people uh that make people feel good like you know when when they either they look back on it or the first time they hear it they go yeah this fucking rocks makes me want to drive my car faster makes me want to <laughs> do this or that i i, I it, it's i i feel like I've, I've done my job as a guitarist you know and whether i had 20 percent writing of it or whether i wrote the whole thing it doesn't really matter at the end of the day because if someone listens to the song and they dig on it then they're digging on the entire project. They're digging on everyone that contributed to that track. So when I, um, I told my brother that I, that I booked you, because I have okay. to tell my brother whenever I book somebody really cool, because he and I both came up on metal and hard rock together. He told me that when he lived in LA, there was a band called Glam Nation that yes, he was. To all the time and it was fantastic. And he wanted me to let you know <laughs> that, that it was fantastic. And um, I didn't get a chance to see you because I wasn't out that way um, in those years. But one thing that I thought was really fun about the band is that you had yet another name, Peter, a name that I, you just said that you don't like to be called, but it was Peter Kensington yes, was your name yes. in that band. And so you all had sort of stage names, I guess. Studio, well, what we band, had to do right? was take a, our middle name. Mm -hmm. We took, everyone took their middle name if they had one. Um, our bassist Stefan, he used his his Yiddish sort of Jewish name, which is Yeshia, and that was it. He just went by, you know, like the way Sting or uh, Prince would have gone. He was he was just Yeshia. But everyone would take their middle name, and it was then they would make up some sort of after name. Like uh, I believe what was uh, Eric Singer was Doyle Harris and his middle name is Doyle. So, you know, I think it's kind of a cool little concept. The band itself, Glam Nation, was a, it was a tribute band to 70s glam in the same sense, in the same way that, um, what is it, um, uh, Eagle, uh, Steel Panther. <laughs> it's like Eagles of Death Metal. No, <laughs> it was Steel Panther. I get the two confused all the time. But uh, Steel, the, the Steel Panther, it was sort of started as a tribute to like hair metal and you know eighties rock. We were a tribute and sort of uh, tipping of the hat to early seventies glam. So we would do uh, Bowie, T Rex. Uh, early Elton John, Mott the Hoople, um, even in some sort of like underground sort of early 70s stuff. The Sweet was a really big band for us to cover. We love doing the Sweets because Eric Dover, who sang in the band, um, I'm trying to think of his name right now, uh, his, his Glam Nation name. <laughs> Because um, I was Peter Kensington, and he was it was there was a, there was a Nikki Lemons. I think that was oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna get angry if I, it'll come to by the end of the interview. But if, if someone knows the uh, name, please put it in the comments of Eric Dover's <laughs> pseudo name. I was busy trying to keep track of all your names and all your well, spellings for Roxy and Doctor. <laughs> well, <laughs> playing with it, that that band, it was it was a cool band to play in. I, I, we started Glam Nation in sort of, I call it the lost summer of 99, maybe 98. Again, it, it, it's kind of, it really is kind of hazy and lost. There was a lot of uh, craziness going down at that point in my life. It was, uh, we were recording the Slash's Snake Pit record. So we needed to let off some steam on weekends because those, those were the only days we had off from the studio. So I formed a little club on Melrose of, at a friend's club. I said, look, I'm going to have one night a week, call it Club American Style. And um, I sort of hosted this night and the band that was sort of the house band for that uh, summer was Glam Nation. And uh, it always ended up in some sort of 
crazy ass, you know, after show. And uh, it was one of those things where people said, ah, that didn't happen. Well, it kind of <laughs> did happen. And um, I was either lucky or unlucky enough to live three blocks down uh, from the club. So the after parties usually happened of where I was renting that house. And um, yeah, it was, it was, like I said, I look back on it and it's a very, uh, fun time but it was definitely intense uh, as far as like pushing pushing the needle and and the you know not drug wise needle but you know push pushing the you know the lever the pushing the you know it, like i said it was oof, yeah when i even when i think about it now i get a little amped up <laughs> like wow you survived that time of glamination <laughs> but um like i said i i, I wouldn't um I wouldn't say that everyone should go through that time in their life because not a lot of people could, could make it through, but there's a lot of people that could. And uh, I, if you could make it through that sort of um, lifestyle at that for that ephemeral uh, part of time, then uh, you come out the other side, hopefully a little bit wiser. And uh, that's hopefully what all of us did. And, uh, you know, a lot of quality entertainment produced during those months <laughs> well i do wonder if something was written you know a lot of original material and that was it was it just kind of like a nice reset to just as a musician as an artist to just do other people's stuff for a little bit and you I mean you said you were working on um slash and stuff too but no. just to like just be able to play things you love and then just like move forward and go back to it, your own stuff. well we were playing a lot of original music outside of glam nation so that little safe zone of glam nation was like and that those songs all those great songs that we were doing in glam nation these great early 70s covers were sort of finding their way into our original stuff as well because i was working on you know my solo record stuff as well as working on uh alice's brutal planet as well as we're you know doing slash's record as well so it, there was a you know there was a time when there was a lot of stuff going on at the same time and that was the beauty of living in los angeles during that time is that there you know you could at any given night just drive just to, to someone's home studio and uh lay down a track and then it would be released you know relatively quickly all right. So at some point in your career, you met up with a gentleman named Alice Cooper. And I always want to know, when was the first time you met Alice? Um, and was it around the time that he was looking at you as a possible guitarist? Or had you met him before that? No, I had never met Alice. The only way I knew of Alice was from my roommate, uh, Johnny Holiday, And when I first moved down to Los Angeles. So this was like in 83, 84. Um, when I first moved down, I had a roommate. He went on to be, uh, be in a band called Star Star. And Johnny Holiday turned me on to Alice Cooper. And it wasn't the original band. It was Welcome to My Nightmare, Alice. And the first time I heard Cold Ethel, I was like hooked. It was great. And so I was a fan. You know, I'd heard about Alice growing up, obviously, but he was one of the scary types. He was one of those <laughs> ones that was kind of like, oh, he's dangerous. He's very dangerous. And, he, you know, when I finally met him, I realized he's, he's not dangerous. He's definitely on stage. He's dangerous. He'll stab you if you don't know where you're at on stage. But uh, the first time we actually did meet was at the audition. And originally, uh, Alice had thought about having Gilby Clark who I was playing with in his solo band at the time, who's from Candy. So he had it all intertwines and works together. Uh, Gilby and I being the guitar players, but Gilby was still really heavily involved in his solo career and had those obligations. So uh, he sort of gave me the blessing and, and sort of said, hey, you got to go out and get this. This is the next step for you, Roxy, uh, to go and get this Alice Cooper gig. And that's exactly what I intended to do. And I went down there uh, to mates rehearsal that was in, it was in the Valley in North Hollywood. And uh, to this day, it's, it's still there. Tons of amazing bands coming out of mates and practicing there all the time and rehearsing there. Um, but we had auditions right there. And what really impressed me was that Alice was at the audition 
He chose to be at the audition, not like, you know, other singers who I've tried out for in the past where they just didn't show up or they videotaped the, the audition. No, he was there. He wanted to pick up on the vibe of the player. And uh, luckily that day, everything seemed to work out uh, the way I wanted it to. The way I played the best I could. I knew that there was, you know, uh, they already had their choice in, in a way of a few shredder guys that were, you know, much better at those types of 80s Alice songs than I was going to be, because that was their forte. And and I think they they kind of pretty much decided on Reb Beach being the guy because he was such a great player and and you know he's just such an easy guy to be in a band with. And that's a lot of th things people don't realize sometimes. It's like it's not just being a talented guy like Reb is. You have to also be, you know, able to do the hang and be able to, you know, get along with people on a bus for months and months and months. And Reb was definitely that guy. So I went in there as sort of the, the original band 70s type, type of vibe. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be some sort of eye candy. I'll, I'll, I'll play the part. All those years of me, you know, staring at the mirror, posing, paid off maybe for that audition because... <laughs> You know, but but then I, you know, at the end of the day, I played the chords right and I, I I held down the foundation. And then when it was time for me to lay down a solo and lay down, you know, maybe more of a legato lick, um, I I sort of was able to do that. And um Alice and I locked eyes at the very end while I was walking out. And I kind of I had a I was very confident when I left the room. So um luckily one day, two days later, I got the call. I was in it, but you know, it was only, it was really only going to be for one year. It was, it, it was just one tour because Alice didn't know if he wanted to tour for that long after that, because he had just come off of a sort of a hiatus, a couple of years of not touring. So the offer was, you know, let's do a co-headline tour with the Scorpions. Mm -hmm. And of course I was like, shit that's that's enough that's great yeah. if that's all it happens out of this experience at least i i get to play all the big uh sort of amphitheaters across the u.s on this tour and um it ended up being you know 96 and what is it 2020 right now so 2021 so he, alice even though i've taken a couple of years off here and there alice has toured every single year since then and, and you know what, 2020, this year, with nobody touring, we still got one tour in. We still got an Australian tour in. And, and way back in February uh, of 2020, we were able to uh, go down and do a tour with MC50 and Airborne and Alice Cooper. And so we can definitely say that, you know, Alice has toured every single year since that day in, in that tour in 96. That's amazing. Um, what was that like for you? Because I imagine that this may have been the first time in your career that you get to do those bigger venues, like those really, you know, huge venues with all these yeah. people. What's that like for somebody who's probably imagined himself wanting to play those <laughs> since he was a kid to actually yeah. be on the stage and do it? Um, it's kind of everything that you thought it would be because you've been imagining that for so many years, you've been visualizing it. And then you, you almost have a, a bit of an out of body experience where you say going, okay, this is the picture in my mind. I, I take a step back. I see my sort of silhouette in, and then I see a bunch of people in these, uh, in these amphitheaters and these venues and these, you know, auditoriums and whatever. It was like, okay, this is, this is happening. And, and it wasn't that shocking because I had, I guess the, I didn't wish it, I intended it. And I think that's kind of a, it, it, there is a distinction. I didn't wish, I didn't just dream about it and not do anything about it. Every single day, or at least as many days as I, is, is, that I can remember, I put something into getting to that and achieving that goal. Um, and I try and do the same thing uh, up even today, you know, because I'm not, I feel I'm not done with my touring career. I don't want to be, I intend to, to continue to tour. And now I have another goal, you know, which is I intend to have the most successful uh, guitar course and guitar method 
out there because I really feel that, that, that we've created something really special that'll help people. So until that, and I'm doing something every single day to make that sort of goal a reality. It's not a dream. You know, you could say it's a dream, but I, but, but dreaming means you don't do anything. You just sit back and you go, Oh, it'll happen. Well, no, it's not going to happen. If you, you have to trust that it's going to happen, but you also have to put stuff into action. And that's sort of, that's one of the things that I teach, you know, with the, uh, with, with the course is that, you know, you have to act upon what you're visualizing. If not, it's just a dream. And if, if, and if it's just a dream, eh, most times dreams don't happen. Right. You know, but if it's definitely an intention and it's a goal that you intend to achieve, those all will happen. So this last, I think it's been, I don't know how long it's been, nine months, 10 months, five years, who knows? We've all, you know, we've all been sort of distancing and doing that. And I've spent a lot of time with you watching your podcasts and um, System 12, which I started recently on that. And one thing that I um, found was your TED Talk, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, first of all, congratulations for doing that. I Thank think that's you. amazing. Um, yeah. Second of all, I, from what I understand, you only found out about it maybe like the night before, so you didn't yeah. really have time. To, to do <laughs> I always wanted to do you. a TED Talk. I just had no idea how it was going to happen because how many rock and rollers get to do TED Talks? It's not really, you know, usually it's some sort of scholar, it's some sort of, you know, scientist, it's some sort of, uh, you know, so, somebody that's that's not in the music world as much. I know there's a lot out there now and, there, and it's growing and growing, but you know, I'm, I was thinking, well, in my position, you know, I'm not a household name at all. I, I've, I've played with some household names. You know, you, you take Alice and you take Slash. Those guys are household names. I get it. But you know, I'm still working on just finding my sort of position and where, I fit into this whole equation. And, and then this came around, this opportunity came around. And the most important thing for me was, you know, you take that opportunity and you make the most of it. Because originally they, they had just wanted me to play a couple songs. It's almost like a, uh, uh, a break between, because I, I think, uh, what was the girl's name? Um, uh, the Swedish activist who's very, very, oh, very... Great. Like Greta, the little Greta, Greta. She 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 was the headliner, and she went on right after me. Oh. And and there was there was like another. There's more of a, a, a an ambassador, and a diplomat that went on before me. So I was sort of like the you know again the, 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 the sort of comic <laughs> relief, I guess you know. But then I I said I, I said listen listen I I have something to say that I want to talk about and. I'll do the TED talk. I'll play a song. It's fine I, I, because I love playing music. I love performing, but I also want to get my point across. And they said, well, great. Well, we will treat you like any other TED talk. You have between 11 and 15 minutes to make your point. And um, if you can put in, you know, a couple songs and your point in between there, go for it. And so I was able to do that. And then, you know, it was, and it ended up being a bigger thing because that was right around the time that uh, Greta started getting huge headlines, like literally right after that TED talk, then she went to the States and, and then became like this complete, you know, I, she, she ended up being sort of bigger I think than she even imagined it was going to be. So it was cool to be part of that program. And um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm happy with what I was able to, to put out there with my TED Talk, because I, I feel that, you know, at the end of the day, any of those TED Talks or anything that you do, um, if you feel like it's going, it, it's important to say on, on a bit on a high platform, such as a TED Talk, it has to be inspiring. And um, hopefully my, my TED Talk was inspiring because it was all, all about um, the three Ps. And I think you know about those I three Ps. Yeah, and uh, I, I talk about the three Ps a lot, uh, whether it's teaching guitar or whether, and, and it was actually, you know, I was, it, it was a, a woman from Nashville that told me about the three Ps. A lot of people think it was Alice and I kind of allude to it being, you know, a bunch of different people. I kind of keep it a mystery, but to be honest with you, I still remember sitting 
in, in a cafe in Nashville, Tennessee, one day, and, and her telling me, you know what, it's about three things. It's about practice, persistence, and patience. Mm-hmm. And those are the three Ps, and they really hit home for me. And if you wanted to hear about the rest and how those all sort of equate together, go check out the TED Talk. After yeah, this, I, though, after I will this. link it. I will link it below because I think everybody should see it. The performances were beautiful, and your talk, even though you didn't get to talk a super long time, it really you really made the point um, very quickly, and you're a shining example of that as well. Well, I had to. I had to make that point. Now you know. Now you know. If you get asked for a TED Talk, get your shit together in 11 and 15 minutes. That's it. Unless you're, you know, unless you're Tom Hanks, then I think they give you as long they as you fucking want. Probably talk as long as <laughs> so I, I know you as a person who has a passion for sharing information, and there's two two main things that I think of when I think of you in this. One are your podcasts, um, which uh, by the way, I think are amazing. I try to watch every single one and at some point I will see Thank them you. all. And um, also I, th- I think that you and I are trying to do the same thing and that you're trying to share information and then kind of inspire people, give respect to people who do deserve respect and give love to this kind of rock metal community, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I really appreciate your interviews because I know that I go, I tend to go long. I started off saying I was going to do 30, 40 minute interviews and I decided that they need to be as long as they need to be slash as long as people will stay on with me because. Well, and that's the thing, long form podcasting, you know, you could say that uh, Joe Rogan's sort of the godfather of that. And um, because I can sit there and listen to a three hour Jordan Peterson podcast with him and Joe Rogan. And all I wanted to do, you know, originally was just just get that same sort of conversation going. If You don't want to ever milk something for longer than it's supposed to be. But if it feels like it should go on, if you and you have that time, you know, and you do have an audience, you should definitely get as much out as you can. And and I wanted to do the same thing that, that Rogan was doing for his comedians and then eventually other personalities that he worked with uh, for musicians, because I think there's so many inspiring musicians out there now that have a lot to say that have been through a lot and just through their life experience could uh, inspire a lot of up and coming musicians, you know, for, for things to do and, things not to do. Yeah. I've, I've, we've heard both, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, you know, it's funny because people, I would say outside of this world, people who aren't necessarily fans of huge fans of music, I've had friends go, oh no, they should only be 15 minutes long or 20 or whatever. And my feeling is if you're a real fan, you want the longer, more in-depth interview. You don't, you know, anybody could tell you what kind of shampoo they use and the things <laughs> that you're already, you know. So I, I, that's what I love about your show, though. I think your Orianthi was like two hours, which, and I yeah, said- there's a little bit of hypocrisy, isn't it? Because it's like, we live now in this world of the, of the you know, the 30 second attention span and you want these quick edits, but at the same time, it's the same landscape if, as you could have a four hour discussion with somebody. And if you want to pop in, for a couple minutes here and then pop out, then fine. Right. I mean, we've we've sort of uh, solved that sort of problem of having to be there for the entire show by cutting it up into clips. And again, that was sort of an idea that that Joe Rogan does. And like you, if you get drawn in by one of our clips, one of our in the trenches clips, then you can watch the long form uh, interview with that artist. And uh, it ends up happening a lot uh, where people will see the, see the little bit, you know, the five minute clip, but then they're like, Oh man, I had to watch the whole entire interview. So, (laughs) so, so the, the podcast is called in the trenches with Ryan Roxy. It's um, we've been doing it now for almost over a year. Um, We're really happy with it. And um, it's, it's growing and growing and um, yeah, hopefully through this podcast, uh, we'll get some more listeners out there and uh, basically we concentrate on anybody you know I, I mean at first it was all guitar players but anybody's associated with music and sometimes not even associated with music we've had some actors on as well i want to expand it in 2021 um basically just people that entertain and make a living entertaining because um there's a lot of people that what that listen to the podcast watch the podcast that want to be entertainers themselves and i'm telling you this information that people our guests uh give out during these podcasts is so valuable and they don't even know that they're doing it a lot of times, you know, 
Like there, there's so many times that you just like go, wow, you just, you just dropped a knowledge bomb on us and we have no, and you had no idea you were doing it. It's like, well, maybe I had a little idea. <laughs> well, even you and I, one of my other favorites is you and Kane Roberts. And it was really, yes. cool because I came into Alice Cooper with Kane, you know, kind of Kane Roberts era and that, you know, that super like metally, like heavy stuff. And so when I think of Alice, I just, I think of him as like a metal guy, but not everybody does, right? Everybody yeah. associates with him depending on when they were introduced to him. And it was so interesting to hear you talk about it even today and in that interview about how, you know, like you're kind of the guy who's sort of leans more the seventies and like Kane Roberts was the 80 guy, eighties guy. I assume like Nita's probably the 80, you know, leans towards that. She takes most of those too. solos. Yeah. I'll yeah. do, I'll do more of the seventies solos. Nita will do uh, a lot of the 80s solos and then but luckily alice gives us that that freedom he gives us that sort of space to sort of always have double triple solos i mean mm -hmm. tommy gets his his share of soloing in as well tommy Hendrickson, um our third guitar player as well so there's myself nita strauss and tommy Hendrickson, three guitar player onslaught <laughs> all to play one kane roberts song <laughs> Because <laughs> Kane literally played uh, about as much. He he filled up enough space for three guitar players. Um, and, and the funny thing is, you know, it's like years after I was in the band, I'd been in the band for about 10 years and people would, would always say, are you the guy that, are you guys with the muscles? And I'm like, no, no. Like, Not even totally Kane not is the guy with the muscles anymore. You know? <laughs> He'll be the first to tell you, man. He was on a lot of, a lot of juice, you know? <laughs> That's really funny. But I, I learned a lot though, because honestly, like, and I've, I mean, I've seen you play, you guys are amazing, but it never occurred to me that like, you know, like Alice, when he's auditioning guitar players or when he's pulling you guys back in, you know, probably wants to think about this, but I never thought about that because I'm just kind of there to be entertained and it's such a perfect, it's like the ultimate show. The Alice Cooper show is like the well, ultimate The thing show. about Alice is I, I feel that he picks the right players for the right times and the right eras because he has so many different eras of alice cooper there's so he's like the madonna of of rock and roll in the sense where he had so many different looks at a time you know every couple albums the the direction would change the sort of uh the sort of concept might change a little bit. He's always Alice Cooper, but yeah. maybe this time he's a little bit more garage band. Maybe this time we were a little bit more uh, drop tuning as with the Brutal Planet and, and Dragon Town albums. But then we went sort of garage rock. And, and so there are these concept albums and sort of genres that he, that he goes into every once in a while. And he gets the players that sort of correlate for those times. Luckily, I've been able to sort of morph with him during those times and those eras. And, um, you know, anyone that's, that goes on the internet and they Google Ryan Roxy blonde dreadlocks, you'll see, because, you know, at one point I did have like blonde dreadlocks. At one point I, me and, you know, Chuck and I had mohawks, you know, Chuck Garrick, the guitar, the bassist for the band, um, who also plays in his own band, Bisto Blanco. I, I'm, I'm always trying to give as much credit to the other musicians that I play with uh, as possible because I realize that we all have other stuff going on. You know, I, I, you know, Nita has her whole enterprise going on, you know, with her workouts and, 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 and the things that she does and she has her lessons as well. And, you know, basically just Nita Strauss being Nita Strauss and, and then Tommy as a producer, Tommy Hendrickson as a producer, Chuck as, as, as a producer himself, but also has his own band, Bisto Blanco. Then myself, you know, I have the podcast and I have, you know, I have system 12, I have my own solo records and I have this, this solo album that I put out called Imagine Your Reality. So I got a lot of stuff going on myself. And then we all work for a guy named, you know, and of course, Glenn Sobel, the, the human you know, drum machine, love that guy. And Glenn, and so between all of us, we all work for the guy who's probably the busiest man and busiest entertainer on the planet, which is Alice Cooper, because he's got a million things going on, you know? So I'm always trying to spread it out, but at the same time, just be have people be aware that if you dive into the Alice Cooper world and the, there's a lot of characters to sort of uh, follow and you can pick and choose which ones you like and, and you can pick and choose which rabbit holes to sort of go down because there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> Put it that sure, and that's just, that's just who's, you know, currently in the Alice Cooper band. Like oh yeah, that's not even talking about the tons of amazing <laughs> bands that he's had in the past. I mean, I've I've been lucky enough to play with such 
amazing lineup. So, you know, the, like I, I was telling you about Red Beach, I've been able to play with him, Pete Friesen, such an, an, another great guitar player. And, you know, one of my favorite live guitar players to play with, which is Eric Dover, one of my favorite guys that I've ever been in the studio with and played in bands with. So, I mean, yeah, if you, like I said, if you, if you want to, if you want to have a place, a home with a family, sort of almost mafia esque, uh, sort of start following Alice Cooper and uh, and the Alice Cooper band because it, wow. it it it's it's a long family tree and it's a it's a rich in history. It is absolutely, it absolutely. I mean, I think as a fan, that's how you start. You find a band, and then you find all the bands that they you know make reference to or have played with, and the next thing you know you're a rock yeah. and you're a metalhead, you're whatever it is, because, you know, oh, you yeah. started with that one artist or that one musician. All right. So it. we've talked about a lot of things, but what I really want to talk to you about is your system 12 guitar method. Sure. And a lot of people teach lessons. I'm, I, I know that you, you teach online and you've probably taught over the years as well. And yeah. I've seen you do different things, including free riff Friday, which is a per personal favorite of mine. And this is how I knew you were really passionate about it. And it wasn't just something you know, it wasn't just something you're packaging to make money because every Friday you have this amazing thing called free work Friday and you get on there and you teach a song and you invite people to come, you know, show off their skills, which I think is also show off their people. progress, see how they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing I know from watching it is that you also call us out if we're not actually sitting there with the guitar playing <laughs> <laughs> and you've dealt with me a few times uh, because sometimes I just throw it on, you know, during a lunch break or whatever, just to kind of hang out with you. But you're really, you're really serious about having people really pick up that guitar and play and learn. Um, and so in addition to free Re Friday, you have this thing that we've been uh, referencing to uh, your system 12, system 12 yeah. guitar method. And I've actually also joined on that, um, joined in on that. And I'm really impressed with what I've seen and one of the things I noticed is very clear cut. There is no confusion about what you're asking people to do. So I want you to tell me a little bit about what it was that you were thinking when you went into this and what it is that makes System 12 different than, let's yeah. say, any other Easy. out Easy. there. Yeah. Very simply put, I want as many people to start their guitar journey as possible because guitar playing is so beneficial to your life, regardless of what you want to do with it, professionally, hobby, uh, therapy, all across the board. If you can learn how to play an instrument, especially the guitar, there are so many benefits to it. You know, so many good things happen when you start discovering music, playing music, and not just being a spectator, but being an actual contributor to music. I'm telling you, it's good for your, it's good for your soul. It's good for your psyche. And like from the beginning, the goal is to get as many people started on their guitar journey because everybody's journey is going to be different, right? Everybody's going to learn at a different sort of pace. But what we've done with the system 12 and what I've done is taking all the years of the experience that I've had, because I was teaching guitar lessons when I was 16, mm -hmm. I was teaching 14 year olds. I was <laughs> actually, actually teaching, you know, Phil Demel was one of my first guitar students oh, cool. that I ever had. He was, I think I, I was 16, he was 14. Right. So the thing is, I, I've taken all these shortcuts and no matter where you are with playing guitar, you you actually might be have been playing guitar for a couple of years, but the System 12 is still going to help you because it gives you this foundation, fundamental, a certain way of looking at the guitar. Very simply put, System 12, you know, right off the bat, if someone asks you how many notes are there in music total with like, you know, the seven notes that are A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but with their sharps and flats, how many notes are there total? What would you think? What would you guess? Oh, now you're putting me on the spot. Well, but I named I named it already. I named the, I named how many notes? Twelve. <laughs> There's twelve notes total. That's all you have to. If you you know, with their sharps and flats, there's twelve notes in music, total. So with that, you know, there's twelve frets on a guitar neck until the guitar neck basically starts over. So we've we've constructed a method and a system where everything sort of revolves around the number 12. 
Um, there's 12 lessons in the course. Basically, you will learn 12 riffs, 12 songs, you know, that'll it'll combine, it'll combine so many similarities and so many uh, sort of things that, that, that you'll, you'll walk away going, oh, yeah, 12 easy. I get it now. I see the guitars a certain way because it is about, you know, things that we already know. We might not know music, but we all know numbers and we all know out letters and alphabet. So if you can count your ABCs up to the letter G and then just count up to the number 12, I can teach you guitar. And uh, the easiest way to go check it out is actually just take the first lesson for free. We have the first lesson that's up there. Lesson one, that's uh, completely free up on ryanroxy.com slash system12. And uh, basically, try out that lesson. You'll be playing a song by the end of the lesson. And if that doesn't convince you that it's the easiest method and most comprehensive method that's out there, then I don't know what will. Because it, it's, like I said, it's one of those things that we've really tried in the, to inspire. And in, in the technology that we're using, we have this... Um, really cool company called sound slice that that we found and and they have this scrolling text in tablature so even if you've never you know read music or you don't know about tablature all this stuff is explained along with the videos and plus with the videos we have three different angles that you can look at and learn from some people like to learn you know either close up or wide angle view or even this older over the shoulder view there's a lot of there's a lot of positives about it, and so far, and I feel that it hasn't. Um, we haven't even really officially released it. I've been talking about it, but we haven't. It, we're not completely out there because it was so. It's still so new to mm-hmm. us, and we're still figuring out. Okay, how can we reach the right amount of people? Because you know, every single day there's there's some sort of like me, some sort of 11, 12 year old that are, is saying, you know what? I'm going to learn how to play guitar. And it doesn't even mean that they have to be 11 or 12. Maybe they're, maybe they're 40, maybe they're 50. You know, there's, there's people like that are much later in life that are going, you know what, this is the year I want to learn guitar. So if there's ever a time that you ever felt like this is the time I want to learn guitar, I think it's, it's worth giving system 12 a try. Yeah. And just to lay it out there for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, and you definitely should take the first lesson for free because it's it's out there for you to try. So why Maybe not? You can put the link up or whatever. I'll link it, I'll link it, it below the, as well, for sure, yeah. so that they can find it easily. Um, but it's like you're in a video up top. And then at least the way I view it on my phone is right below that is that technology that you're talking about. It's the scrolling text and scrolling tab. And you can also um, you can also sort of let it know, I want to repeat this piece so that once you learn the lesson, you can kind of go through again and again. You can loop it. You can slow it down, which is another one of those amazing things. You, you can take it down to 80%. You can take it down to 75%. You know, you learn at your pace. And that's what I think is really important because there's going to be some people that just take in music and, and, and get certain concepts quicker than others, which is fine. But there's, but, but you know what? you get to learn at your own pace. And um, that's what I think at the, at the end of the day, all the fundamentals are taught. You're going to know your notes. You're going to you learn, you know, all your uh, chords, all your bar chords, your fifth string bar chords, your sixth string bar chords. And I teach those first before open chords. Anybody who knows open chords or first position chords, you might call them, or even cowboy chords. The hardest thing for a, for a beginning guitar player, I think, is to ask them to that who've never been around a neck and never been around a guitar to, to start moving their hand in all these weird positions and, and expecting them to just change and play, you know, some sort of Bob Dylan song in like, you know, the first month. No, what I want you to do is just take your first finger, learn the notes on the fifth string and the sixth string, And then just add one more. So now you know your power chords. Now you know the names of the chords. Now you can actually start playing songs. Only later do we teach the open position chords because now your your hand is used to moving around. So there there is a method behind our our madness and the way that we sort of 
uh, teach the course. It's, it's a little bit unconventional. It's not traditional. And um, I think it's better for that because I think what we, the way we teach it is that it's the natural progression of how you would want to learn guitar. And uh, of course, the last lesson going with the system 12 is that you get to sort of a payoff. You get to learn your 12 bar blues. So there you are. It's all right. The system 12. Well, you've actually given us more than that, even because there is a community on Facebook that you can join as soon as you become a part of it. I've actually yes. found that community to be really lovely because um, there's a lot of help there, but also there's a lot of people cheering each other on. So there's people who a are super advanced who are yeah. like every single day they're playing something really impressive. And then there's people <laughs> who are like me who are like, you know, basic, basic questions. <laughs> Everybody's so supportive and, you know, chimes in and stuff, which I think is great. Another thing that you guys have on there that I think is really phenomenal is you do these little videos. So I guess I should step back, up, uh, take a step back and say that every week, like week one, there was like a week one video that gives you a few extra yeah, tips. Yeah, it gives you a little oh, tip. It's that, that's the System 12 challenge. And, and basically we have a couple of the guys that are on the team, Robbie Miller and Dave Rattenberry. I mentioned them earlier, but they're giving sort of what sort of like cliff notes, if you will. Remember when you went to school and you didn't actually want to read The Great Gatsby, but you got that little, <laughs> the little cliff notes uh, version of it. You you get like the what, what you should be, sort of the talking points of what you should be learning, how much time you should be putting it into. And they've done a really good job making really short, uh, uh, concise videos that will share of what the highlights of that week are. And like I said, you can join any time. It doesn't have to be, but again, go at your pace. But this group that we put together, this Facebook group, that is included when you do join up with System 12. And um, it is a really cool supportive group. And I go on there. I, I get to see everyone's progress uh, from time to time. And it's really great that people are putting up their own videos. In fact, I just put on... Um, I just put up and um, posted one of uh, one of our RGA, we call it the Roxy Guitar Army, one of their videos of them, you know, playing lesson two and playing the exercise in lesson two because because she was really proud that she was doing it and she did it, you know. So like so she learned Wild Thing, the song, you know, on the second lesson and it was <laughs> he was happy about it. And so we posted it up and then we're happy for her. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been a wonderful community, but really you have so many tools because you have the system 12, which has this community, these extra videos, in addition to the ones that are like the lesson themselves, you have free riff Friday. And even in the trenches to me, I think people really learn a lot. Um, if they really like listen to these conversations and especially if they're, um, interested in pursuing this as a career. And so my last question for you is um, beyond having, you know, practicing and being persistent and patience, what additional advice would you give to a musician who is serious about making this a part of their life in a real way? Um, submerse yourself. The, the best advice I could get is just really, really in, get into the trenches, you know, go associate yourself with the style of music, the type of musicians, the sort of music that you want to be involved in because we live in this completely technological connective sort of society. Now, don't be afraid to direct message, you know, your favorite musician, Maybe they won't respond. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe they might not. But you know what? A lot of them will, mm -hmm. especially during these times, because we realize, everybody realizes the power that we have of actually make changing and for a positive change of someone's life, which is, could be a musical sort of thing that, that they're inspired by. If a musician can actually help another musician out or an up and coming musician with, with one or two words or one of encouragement, then I, you get a lot out of that because it's the validity of, of like, okay, I, I, I've been able to, um, I've been lucky enough to play music and play on stages and, and sort of have a bucket list check off of all these amazing venues I've been able to play over the years. But also what else have I done? Well, inspired a, a, a lot of people to also pick up guitar as well 
And that's more gratifying, I think, for a lot of musicians to know that their um, contribution to music helps, you know, perpetuate music. It's, it's really important. So don't be afraid um, and don't be intimidated to reach out to some of your favorite musicians and, and, and sort of become part of that community. As, like, like I said, the, the Roxy Guitar Army were really supportive of each other and you'll find out how many people you know, are, are in your position that want to learn. And it might not be, you know, a young kid that's, that's, that's just up and coming and wants to start. Get, no, it might be someone that's much older, but there's a lot of older people that you're, that you associate yourself with now. And now you have a community that you can sort of, you know, get, get inspiration from and sort of, get uh, advice from and sort of learn together. So that's what we're trying to create over at System 12. And um, basically, you know, 2021 is going to be dedicated to that as well as getting our asses back out on the road, because that is important too, because at the end of the day, you know, it's it's all good to to pass the torch of rock and roll on to the next, uh, uh, to the next person. And, and hopefully that their guitar journey leads them to uh, a, a really great career. But like I said, I, I have lots of goals that I still um, intend on fulfilling and uh, touring and continuing to uh, live the life that I've been able to live uh, with music is definitely one of them. So in proof of that is that, you know, in just, I'm not sure when this is going to be coming out, but, you know, just beginning of 2021, I will, put uh, a new single out that I that's uh, basically the 10th single of my uh, solo album that I had released uh, a while back. But I, you know, I started this concept that like, look, every song on the album should have its due. So that's what I did with this song, with this album, so um, imagine your reality. I said, every song should have a little sort of showcase. And I was able to release 10 singles with 10 lyric videos and 10 separate releases. And that 10th release is coming up in 2021. So that'll be it. Then it'll be time to actually get my ass back into the studio and start working on a new one. I, to give, I want to gift you something. So you have your three sure. keys, practice, persistence, and patience. Yes. But I think you've done a lot of amazing things and you've been really innovative. You use technology wisely and well. And I found a P word, which I'm not familiar with, but I will give you the definition, Promethean, having the skill and imagination to create new things. So I think your fourth P is Promethean because you've done a lot of really cool things with your technology, including doing a single a week for your album for every single song, including okay. doing the acoustic and regular you know, versions of every song, Besides using every technology story, yeah. wisely um, for System 12, not just throwing it out there for the sake of doing it, but like really thinking about it. So I think you are also Promethean if I'm using that word correctly. Good, thank you so much. I'll take it. <laughs> I will just don't ever ask me to spell it. <laughs> I could well. never. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. This is really, this has been a pleasure and an honor. And I really, I hope to have you back again someday so we can continue the conversation. And I can ask you the pages and pages of nerdy nerdiness that I had that we didn't have time for today. Well, perfect. Uh, you know what? We already have a date set when both of our uh, podcasts are on top of uh, the old YouTube. And so we'll see you sometime, sometime either in 21, 22. Sound sounds good? good? All right. Sounds cool. good. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sarah. See ya.